But my question to you and my question for myself as I've been wrestling with this idea all week long is what will heaven be like? Well, in today's conversation, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture out of the book of Revelation chapter 21. We were there last weekend, so if you have your Bibles, turn there again, whether it's in paper or digital form. And in the Bible verses that we're going to look at together today, there are at least five characteristics, or I'm suggesting there are at least five characteristics that the Bible writer informs us that heaven, permanent heaven, is going to showcase. And so as we read these verses, for for starters, see if you can identify what these five characteristics are, and then then I'm going to kind of unpack these verses for us together. So Revelation chapter 21, we're going to start reading at verse 1, which the first characteristic is found there, and uh, then we'll unpack it. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. This is what the Bible writer tells us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God and out of heaven, and a bride from heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the waters of life. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all the liars, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, it's important for us to remember, I think, that the person who's writing this is a guy by the name of John. John was Jesus' best friend when Jesus was here on this earth. And when during, following the, the, the the death and resurrection and eventually the ascension of Jesus for an early season in the, in the life of the early church believers, there was a lot of religious persecution. And John, one of Jesus' apostles, one of his disciples, the Bible describes him as a man who, who Jesus loved, was, was exiled. Part of his persecution, religious person, persecution that he experienced, he was exiled to a, this island called Patmos from which he probably wrote, wrote the Gospel of John and here the book of Revelation. And while on this, on this island of Patmos, the Bible writer, or God gives John sort of this vision, this heavenly vision of what is, is to come. He gives him a glimpse, if you will, of what permanent heaven is going to look like. And here in verse 1, we're told the first us, the first characteristic that heaven is going to be like. So write this down for those of you taking notes in your app. And that it's this, God's new heaven will be earthly. God's new heaven will be earthly. Verse 1, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 3 says, the home of God is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. So God's new heaven, as I referenced earlier today in our in our in my opening, is going to be merged with a new earth. And though merged into one, here's the question for you to think about. Why would he then reference a new earth? Why, just, why not just call it heaven? If earth ceased to exist at Jesus' second coming, there would only be heaven. But that's not what the Bible writer tells us, is it? He said there's going to be a new heaven and there's going to be a new earth, so both heaven and earth are going to exist. Now think logically about this, okay? Don't over-spiritualize this. What do we know about the earth? Our current existence, my earth and your earth, has dirt and waters and flowers and trees and people and natural resources, does it not? 
The Bible writer is informing us that the first earth, this earth, brothers and sisters, is a prototype for the new earth, which God is going to put into place following Jesus' second coming. And this new earth and this new heaven will likely have new rocks and new mountains and new rivers and new flowers and new, you know, animals, all without blemish much like it was at the beginning of creation before Adam and Eve sinned. You know, children will often ask, uh, Pastor Mike, are there going to be animals in, in heaven? You know what the Bible says about that? I was going to dive into that a little bit, but I'm going to say that for another conversation. But if, as a teaser, if you want to look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9, oh, Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9, it seems to suggest, but because it talks about what God's holy mountain, and on God's holy mountain, there will be animals, and there will be, there were, it says how on God's holy mountain, which is a reference for heaven, there's, children can stick their hand in a, in a, a snake pit, and they won't be bitten. Are you familiar with that passage of scripture? So we're going to talk about, will there be animals in heaven maybe in a future conversation? Randy Elkhorn in his book on heaven writes this, and I'm going to quote him. He says, God placed mankind on earth to fill it, rule it, and develop it for God's glory. But that plan was never fulfilled. Why was that plan never fulfilled? Because Adam and Eve sinned, right? Right? And so he says, should we therefore conclude that God's plan of creation was ill-conceived, thwarted, or abandoned? No, he writes, these conclusions do not fit the character of an all-knowing, all-wise, sovereign God. Sisters and brothers, creation in the words of God when we read the book of Genesis was good. It was very good. Is that not what God said? And so I don't think that it's beyond the realm of possibility that when God initiates this new heaven and this new earth, that we will experience aspects of God's original creation design. In fact, the likelihood is strong that we will. David Chilton in his book, Paradise Restored, writes this. He says, Adam and Eve and their children were to extend the blessings of paradise throughout the entire world again, but because of sin that didn't happen, right? He says, salvation therefore restores man to his original calling and purpose and guarantees the man's original mandate to exercise dominion under God over the whole earth and it will thus be fulfilled. So what's the transferable concept? I propose that for those of us who put our faith in Jesus and proclaim that he is our Savior and Lord, in this life, on this current earth, we have a kingdom responsibility to take care of our world. Do you hold that conviction? And how we do that here on this earth is likely going to determine what our kingdom responsibilities that God will give us to steward in the next one. And maybe I'll spend some time in in upcoming conversations talking about that, where the Bible seems to suggest that we're going to have kingdom responsibilities in this permanent heaven. And part of, I think, God's determination, when you look at what Jesus taught about the good steward and all these things, it's going to be determined in part by how we lived here on this earth and how we stewarded our kingdom responsibilities here on this earth. You've heard me talk about before, I, I think our, our, our stewardship, uh, trust assignment, so to speak, in the world to come has less to do with our success, if you will. It's more to do has our willingness to make a shot, take a shot at it. Swing the bat, kick the ball, try, do something. Better to fail and not try than to, f- not, than to fail to try, right? You've heard that before. How are you stewarding your kingdom responsibilities here on this earth? You will be judged, and God is going to determine what to do with that in the next life to come. I saw that on display this past week. Anybody have a chance to watch or listen to uh, RFK Jr.'s speech on Friday when he suspended his presidential campaign? I knew it was coming, so I I tuned in at, 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 at I think it was 11 o'clock, Pacific time. I wanted to hear it live, and I, I was late to it, but I got it midway. And I've never really, I don't really know much about RFK Jr. I know that his dad, Bob Robert, uh, Robert F. 
Kennedy was a, a senator. I know that his uncle, John F. Kennedy, was the president of the United States. Obviously, if you're, you're a Kennedy, you're going to be a part of the Democratic Party. Uh, that I know about him, but I've never really listened to him. I've only heard one speech prior to Friday. My brother, who uh, lives in Seattle, uh, he really is a, a proponent of, uh, he loves uh, RFK Jr. Uh, he's often encouraged me to listen to him. And so I thought I, I need to probably tune in because I think it's a, a, a big deal. And what I was most impressed about RFK Jr.'s speech was his faith. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you had a chance to listen to it? He talks about his faith and how his faith in God has deeply impacted his decisions. And so, for example, one of the things I learned about uh, RFK Jr., and I didn't know this, is that he is a leading voice and advocate in America for environmental, environmental issues, specifically clean water. Did you know that? In fact, there's three things that he's really concerned about. One of that is, is clean water, but the most, probably the most thing that he's most concerned about is the health of our nation's children super impactful for him. And so when he was thinking about his, this, this, this presidential campaign in his, in his press conference with tears flowing down his face, he was announcing his decision to suspend his presidential bin, bid and to support Donald Trump as president. Why? Because apparently both Donald Trump and, and RFK Jr. are concerned about the health crisis facing our, our kids. Now, here's my point. I'm not trying to make a political position here, but here's what I want you to hear. To have the name of Kennedy and to, to, to support a Republican president, you don't think that's, there's a, created a bit of a brouhaha? I saw a headline today on CNN, which is, tends to be the Democratic, you know, and they said, it, they're calling him a traitor. His own family members are coming out and said, how could he do such a thing? How could he betray our family like this? But here's what I want you to hear, and here's how I think it has impact for your life and for mine today. With tears running down his face, recognizing that this, decision, his announcement to support a Republican president, he said, I've, I've been praying about this. I've been praying. He said, I pray every day for 19 years for the health of our kids. Our kids are in, in crisis. And he said, we got to do something. And he said, I went to my own Democratic Party and they wouldn't even have a, a conversation with me. He said, they wouldn't even listen to me. And yet this, 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 Villain, if you will, this man on the other side of that political aisle, he said he would stop. And for two years, we've been going back and forth about how can we impact the life of our, the next generation of children. Here's the point I'm trying to make. RFK Jr. said, I may only have 10 more years in my lifetime to make a difference here in this world, to use my influence. And I can't wait potentially eight years for a president because Kamala Harris wouldn't take his, wouldn't even meet with him. He said, I can't wait eight years to do something about it. So I'm going to go with the enemy. I'm going to go with the guy who he and I share a lot of commonalities and we don't, we don't, we share a lot of differences, but I'm going to do something. He said, because my life here on this earth matters and I want to use it to impact the next generation. And that hit home for me. Because friends, that's what God is telling us. He is calling us to live our life and steward our life responsibilities and our influence to, for the kingdom glory because that's what Adam and Eve were called to do and they failed to do. The Bible teaches in 1 John chapter 3 that Jesus came to eradicate the consequences of human sin, humanity sinned, but Jesus came to reclaim humanity and basically give us a second chance to do, be good managers of God's stuff, which Adam and Eve failed to do in the beginning. And so in my opinion, RFK Jr. is living God's stewardship, is living out God's stewardship desire in full color and his faith in God is guiding him. And don't you know, it should be the same thing for you and for me. So here's a question I want you to think about. It's a question I've been thinking about all week is what's keeping me, what's keeping you from stewarding your life well? What's holding you back, if anything? Is fear? Public opinion? What's my family going to think when I come out and say I'm supporting a Republican president? That's what RFK said. He knew there was going to be consequences. What's keeping you from being a voice at your workplace? What's keeping you of being a voice in your community? What's keeping you from stepping out and doing what God has entrusted to you? He's placed this on your heart, this passion on your heart, and you say, how come no one's doing anything about this? It's because God hasn't given them that passion. God's given that passion to you, to you. 
So let's say a stewardship prayer today, okay? Put everything down if you haven't already. I want you to just take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Not that there's anything spiritual in that, but I just want you to focus down. I want you to take a brief, deep breath in. Inhale. Just hold it. Exhale. Now in your heart and in your mind, I invite you to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, please help me to live courageously. Please help me to steward well my responsibilities and my influence. Now, I want you to think, before we move on, I want you to think of one area or one relationship that God has entrusted to you. For RFK Jr., it's the children of the next generation. It's, the, it's clean water. Those are two things that RFK said, these are important to me. But what is it for you? What relationship has God said, this is a relationship I don't want you to let go of. This is a relationship I want you to put your both arms around. I want you to wrap everything into that. Maybe it's an area of influence. Maybe there's some civic engagement that God's calling you to do. What is it? Now pray this in your heart. Say, Jesus, please help me to represent you boldly here and you fill in the blank. Jesus, please help me to represent you with courage here. And you tell him what it is. Good. Let's move on. Characteristic number two. Friends, here in Revelation chapter 21, in these verses that we just read to, together, I propose that the Bible writer is suggesting that when God establishes his new heaven, which is permanent heaven, and unites it with new earth, which is permanent earth, that God's new heaven and earth, characteristic number two, will exhibit a continuity to the old. God's new heaven will exhibit a continuity to the old. We've talked about this in, in previous conversations, but I'm going to review it. Do you remember how in the Gospels of, of Luke and John, how following Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the tomb, that at first Jesus' followers didn't recognize him? Remember the story in Luke chapter 24 where the two disciples are, are, are walking on the road to Emmaus from Jerusalem to Emmaus and this guy shows up and they start having this conversation and it wasn't until they broke bread that suddenly Jesus sort of shows himself to them and they recognize, whoa, that was Jesus. And they think, wow, wasn't, weren't our hearts burning within us? This, oh yeah, it was totally Jesus. And they rush back to Jerusalem to tell the followers. Remember how Mary was in the tomb following Jesus' death? She's going there and she meets this guy who she thinks is, a, is a, a gardener, right? And she starts to interact with him. And then Jesus calls her out and he says, Mary. And then Mary realizes, oh, this is Jesus. And she clings to him. Or how the disciples, when they were in the upper room, Jesus suddenly appears for him to them. And what do they think he is? It's a ghost, they say. They don't recognize him right away. And then Jesus says, give me some food to eat. Touch my hands. Look at this, touch this scar on my side, the hole in my side. It's me, you guys. Oh yeah, it's Jesus. Even when we read the, the gospel of John chapter 21, there's a story where Peter is trying to get his head around, you know, what's taking place in the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, he's denied Jesus three times and they're out in this boat fishing. When John turns to G Peter, there's this guy, he's giving them instructions for where to throw their nets and he turns to Peter and says, hey, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. It's then that Peter recognizes Jesus, jumps out of the boat and goes to shore. Remember those stories? At first glance, following his resurrection, Jesus was not recognized. But then after some conversation, the Bible records how Jesus' followers recognized him, didn't they? You say, Pastor Mike, what's your point? Here's my point. Jesus' resurrected body had familiarities to his old earthly body. And I'm proposing simply that Jesus is giving us a glimpse into what heaven will be like. And what I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, is not heretical. In heaven, our new body, I propose that Jesus is modeling for us, is going to showcase a continuity to our old ones. You're going to see somebody and you're going to recognize them. You're going to know them. 
That being said, understand that when a Christian gets to heaven, your body will be dazzling, characteristic number three. Somebody say amen to that. In fact, all of God's new heaven, we're told here, will be dazzling. Show of hands, how many of you have ever been to a wedding? Everybody been to a wedding? Okay. How many of you have ever seen a bride in her glory? Just brings a smile to your face, doesn't it? Thinking about weddings and wedding dances and wedding food. You know, for the Jewish nation to whom the Bible was largely written to, Jerusalem was a special place. Jerusalem was where the Jewish temple was housed, and thus Jerusalem was often referred to as the holy city. And so when the Bible writer, the Apostle John here, in the book of Revelation, describes heaven now featuring a new Jerusalem that is as dazzling as a beautiful bride on her wedding day, that's what he says here, he is informing us that heaven will be spectacular. You know, years ago, I was invited, there was a season when I was doing a lot of weddings, and and I did a wedding down at the Montage. I I shared this story with some of you before. The Montage is this amazing, uh, I don't even know if you can call it a hotel. It's, It's like a palace uh, of beauty uh, out on the Laguna Beach. It's, it has this great grassy lawn area that overlooks the P- Pacific Ocean where the weddings and, and, and parties are, are, are made. And then if you go up, so uh, let's say, let's say we're, uh, behind me is the, o- the ocean, here's this grass lawn, then where you're at, there's this pool area. And then if you go up, the, the, the hotel is in like this horseshoe, horseshoe area. And so everybody, when they come out of their room, they get this beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. And on this particular day, it was clear the cool ocean breeze, the weather was perfect. I remember I was, as I was greeting everybody and I was welcoming the bride had come in and I said, hey, welcome on behalf of, I won't tell you their names, uh, so-and-so, uh, we want to welcome you to this venue. And for all of you who are at the pool, and you could, all the people who were at the pool and they were in their swimming suits up at the ends of glass, and all of you up in, the, in your rooms, the whole, the whole montage that was filled with people out on their decks watching, I said, I want to welcome you too. And the whole place just erupted in, a, in applause and you could just hear the noise come down into this, into this amazing wedding. But here's what I want, here's why I'm telling that story. The groom told me, he said, Mike, I'm spending more money on this wedding, on this venue, than some of my family members make an entire year of wages. 100,000 plus, easy. Now, brothers and sisters, this wedding was spectacular. This wedding was dazzling. But in no way, as great as wedding day and venue was, I propose it was nothing remotely close to what heaven is going to be like someday. Look at what the Bible writer tells us in verse 10, Revelation chapter 21. Let's keep reading verse 10. This is what we're told. So he took me to the spirit. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven with God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. Skip down to verse 18. Verse 18. He said the wall was made of jasper and the city was pure gold as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third an agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, I don't even know what that is, pros, the eleventh the jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The 12 gates were made of a single pearls, were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. I can't even read it, it's so amazing. Each gate from a single pearl, and the main street was pure gold as clear as glass. What are we told here, friends? We're told here that God's new heaven will be dazzling. 
A fourth characteristic that the God's new heaven and earth will feature according to these Bible verses, point number four, is that God's new heaven will be populated by redeemed people. That's a characteristic of God's new heaven. It is going to be populated by redeemed people. You know, when Jesus was here on this earth, he often described heaven as a banquet. And if you look at verse 27 here in Revelation chapter 21, it tells us that this banquet is going to be attended by those whose name is written in the book of life. How does a person get their name written in the book of life? Do you all know the answer to that question? We get our name written in the book of life after we have asked Jesus to forgive our sins and be the Lord of our life. Yes? Have you all done that? And if not, what are you waiting for? Here on earth, many believe that more sex and drugs and and alcohol and money and a new car and a new boat and a new house and and a better salary, even a a cabin on the lake or up in the mountains will make them happy. And brothers and sisters, for a short season, it might, but but long term, these possessions won't. Why? It's because what God has designed us for and what many people don't realize is to have a relationship with him. And that relationship with him will come to full fruition when the book of life is opened and God brings down this new Jerusalem and he melds it with this new earth and together we walk with him forever. And nothing less can satisfy I want to take you to one more passage of scripture and then I'll land the plane on this one. I think time's about up here. Go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is in the Old Testament portion of your Bible. It, uh, it's after Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then Isaiah. I think Lamentations comes next, and then Lam- Isaiah. And go to chapter 68. If you have a, a Bible app, it, or actually 65, it, it's a lot easier. But go to Isaiah chapter 65, and then once you find it, skip down to verse 17. Okay, these are great verses, and we're going to start. We're going to we're going to end with this, and then I'll give you characteristic number five. Okay, it's what's found here in these verses. Isaiah chapter sixty-five, verse seventeen. This is what we're told, and we're described here. You're, you're going to see parallel to what we just read here in Revelation twenty-one. The prophet Isaiah says this. Look, he says, God's talking here. I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. No longer will babies die when when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. In those days, people will live in the houses they built and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. For my people will live as long as trees and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won run gains. They will not work in vain and their children will not be doomed to misfortune for they are people blessed by the Lord and their children too will be blessed." I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go and answer their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat like a cow, but the snakes will eat dust. So the good news is there's going to be no snakes in heaven. I can't can't wait for that. In those days, no one will hurt or be destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. Friends, what's the prophet Isaiah telling us here. He's telling us that God's new heaven is going to be pain-free. Characteristic number five in your app notes. Revelation chapter 24, verse 21, verse 4, we read it, that in heaven there's going to be no death, there's going to be no sorrow, there's going to be no crying, there's going to be no pain, there's going to be no evil. You see, Jesus has the capacity to conquer everything. And so while we currently live in a world that is tarnished by sin and therefore suffer the consequences of that sin that sin causes with hope, 
For those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, with hope, we can look forward to the day when all evil is going to be thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And friends, that is a heaven that I am looking for, looking forward to. Are you? So let's close in prayer. For this time being right now, there is pain, there is sorrow, there are, there are hardships. We're going to close in prayer. And I'm going to lead you in several prayers, and maybe one of these prayers you will identify most with. So let me just ask those of you, if there anyone here is hurting today, whether you're hurting physically or emotionally or relationally or maybe even spiritually, if you're hurting, okay, everybody let's just take a deep breath together. Exhale. Now, for those of you here today or watching online, if you're hurting spiritually, let's start there. Maybe you're feeling distant from God spiritually today. Say this in your heart. Say, Jesus, I'd like my relationship with you to be closer. Will you forgive my sins today and remove the separation that currently exists between you and me? Good. For those of you who are here today or watching online who may be hurting physically, and I saw a hand or two raised when I asked that question earlier, will you pray this in your heart? Will you say, Jesus, right now in my life, I'm dealing with a physical health problem. You tell them what it is. And this problem is causing me some pain. This causing, it's causing me pain in my heart. It's causing me concern. It's causing me worry. And so as a great physician, I'm asking you, will you heal me today? With grace and power, will you remove this physical thorn from my life? I need your healing touch. Good. For those of you who are here today or maybe watching online, maybe your pain today is a relational pain. Maybe there's a relational hurt in your life. Maybe you're at odds with somebody. Maybe it's a family member like RFK Jr., right? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. If so, pray this in your heart. Say, Jesus, right now in my life, I'm dealing with this relational problem. And so I'm asking today that you would please heal this fractured relationship with, and then you fill in the blank. Heavenly Father, this world that we live in is tarnished. But with Jesus' help, and the Holy Spirit's activity, Father, together you empower us to make this world a better place. And so, Father, we pray today. We thank you in advance for how you're going to be at work in our life. We thank you in advance for how you're going to be at work in our situations. We thank you in advance for how you're going to use us this week to be your hands and feet as we strive to be encouragers to those in our world and help them maybe to believe in you and to realize that their situation is not hopeless as long as you are a part of it. And so, Father, while we wait for Jesus' second coming and wait for this new heaven and this new earth to be created, God, we pray that you would walk with us today and in the days to come. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you please stand as I send you out? Hands open. Sisters and brothers, I bless you today to, with an increased measure of encouragement so that you might be encouragers to the people who you come in contact with this week, whether it be digitally or in person. I bless you with an increased capacity to love people with your actions, with an ability to do things and not do things. 
that will encourage. I bless you with an increased ability to, to love people with your words by what you say and don't say to be an encourager to those in your realm. I bless you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen and amen. Have a great week, everybody.